I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. My name is Nick. I'm the high school pastor. It's awesome to be with you. And we've been in a series called I Am. We're going to finish up this week. The whole idea of this series is, as we talk about, uh, as we look through the book of John, where Jesus said statements starting with, I am. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the gatekeeper. This is, he's talking about who I am. And today he's saying, I am the true vine. Now, as, we, as we've journeyed through this series, uh, we, we've just kind of talked about this idea of, of the importance of knowing what Jesus has done, but uh, even more importantly, that we know as, as his disciples uh, who he is. It's important that we know who he is uh, so that we can actually believe in the things that he's done. And in your notes this morning, I just want you to write this down, our confidence in what Jesus has done is rooted and who he is. Our confidence in what Jesus has done on the cross, dying, being raised to life, ascending to heaven, our confidence in what he's done is rooted in who he is. The things that he said beforehand that would happen. The things that he stood on, the truth that he spoke, and, and really what Jesus is, is he's everything. He's, he's everything that we need in this life. And if you're like me, you looked in every other place but Jesus. And what we found, what I found, was a dead end road. And so Jesus, this morning, he's, he's the true vine, but he's everything that we need. And so let's look to him this morning. He says this, uh, literally 24 hours, within 24 hours of him uh, being uh, arrested and later crucified, he's teaching his disciples, and he says, I am the true vine. Now, for you and me, that might not carry a lot of weight. How many uh, farmers in the house this morning? Anybody? Yeah, not a, a couple, but not a whole lot. Uh, surprisingly, because we live in the Yakima Valley, I thought, you know, many people would have vineyards. And I mean, I don't have a vineyard, so what can I say? Uh, and I don't have a green thumb either. I planted a Japanese maple, and then I tried to side the back of my house, and I snapped it. So that's my, uh, that's my vine experience uh, but Jesus saying, I am the true vine, would actually have some uh, pretty, uh, pretty amazing ramifications as he's talking to first century Jewish people. And he's saying, I am the true vine. They would understand because in the Old Testament, many times God would refer to Israel, he would refer to God's people as a vineyard or as a vine. And every time he referred to this vineyard, he would say, this is a vineyard that is not pleasing. It is a vineyard that does not produce the fruit that I desire for it to produce. And so every time a vineyard was talked about in the Old Testament, it always came with the declaration that the wrath of God is coming. So these people are sitting around and Jesus starts to talk about a vineyard. He starts to talk about a true vine. And what you can imagine uh, what I imagine that they're thinking is, okay, here it is, right? We've been following this guy for this long, and here's the, here's the like, come to Jesus talk. But actually what he says, he says, I am the true vine. In other words, I have become what you could never become. I am going to do what you could never do. I'm going to accomplish what you could never accomplish. I know that you cannot produce fruit that is pleasing to the Father, but yet I've got your back because I will. And then once you're connected to me, you will be able to produce the fruit that God has called us to produce. So he doesn't bring uh, a declaration of judgment, but instead he brings a declaration of, of grace, a declaration of, of peace between God and man. And, and this, in essence, is the gospel that we can never live up to the standard that God set for humanity to live up to, yet we're still seen as God, seen by God, 
as spotless and blameless and holy in his sight because of Jesus. Not because of our own good works, not because of ourself or, or anything like that, but because of what Jesus has done and who he is. Jesus is the true vine. And so the ramification for us is that he is everything that we need. He became what we could never become. And when we are united with him, we are made with, have peace with God. So, moving on, he says this. Talking about the Father, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Write this down in your notes. As a disciple of Jesus, we can expect pruning. We can expect to be pruned. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like that. Uh, because I know what comes with pruning, right? When you prune a bush, you cut something off. I'm not a plant, but it seems like it would hurt. But I have been through some, through some stuff in life where God's been pruning, and it's a difficult situation, or what have you, and we've experienced a pruning. And so Jesus says, if you're not connected, you're going to be gathered up in a pile to be burned. But if you are connected, you can expect to be pruned. Now, if you're not connected to Jesus this morning, I'm glad you're here. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment how you can get connected to him. And it's ab absolutely simple. But first off, I want to talk to us that are connected to the vine in Jesus and say, listen, we can expect to be pruned. Why? To produce more fruit. When I talk about this idea of producing fruit, what I'm not saying is that we will do a lot more uh, outward things to, to prove our love to God and, and to others. What I'm talking about is actually an inward fruit that we cannot produce on our own. And that's what, how come Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. We cannot produce this fruit on our own, but we have to be connected to, to the vine. And this is the fruit that God wants to produce in our lives, the fruit that Jesus desires to grow in us. And it's found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Now, how many of us in this room, as I read those off, you're like, Psh, I got this in the bag. Like, I'm nailing it, and, and so thanks, but I'm going to take off. I'll catch you after service. No, no, no. All of us can grow in these things. All of us can grow in these things. And I love it how it says there is no law against these things because none of us are going to be like, that's wrong. We don't need to grow in love. Like, who wants to be at peace with somebody? No, no, no. There is no law, meaning there is no governor over these things. Like, ah, you reached the full potential. Nope. Throughout life, we will constantly grow and be pruned and grow and be pruned. And the area in which we will grow is this type of fruit. Now, notice that it's singular, this kind of fruit. So it's many different things, but they're all together. Because without love, we're not going to be very joyful, right? If you're, if you're not patient with somebody, well, you're probably not going to be that kind either. So, so they work together, and God wants to grow these things in our lives. And the way that he does it is, number one, we're connected to the vine, but number two, we're pruned. And pruning actually teaches us how to become more like Jesus. I don't know how we got this um, kind of popular Christianity idea that as soon as we become a, a Christian or a follower of Jesus, then everything in life is like hunky-dory. We just jump on our unicorn and ride to the rainbow. You know, it's like everything's perfect. No, absolutely not. That's not, when I signed up for G, to, to follow Jesus, uh, no one sold me on that. But for whatever reason, we begin to think like, if something's going wrong in our life, well, I must be, I must be off, or where the heck is God, or the devil's, you know, after me. But it's this idea that, listen, when you said yes to Jesus, you began a journey of growing and being pruned, and growing and being pruned over and over and over again. It's not an overnight, like, flip the light switch, bling, I'm perfect now. No, it's a lifelong 
process. And more times than not, God does really good work. He's, he, he's the best gardener when, when he's able to use tragedy, tough circumstances, hardship, confusion in our life to actually prune us to develop more of this kind of fruit. Now, as we travel through those things, we hate being in the midst of them because they're hard, it's, it's, it's painful, it's tough, tiring. But as you travel through a tough situation, you're able to look back and say, wow, God actually grew me so much in that situation. For my wife and I, I'm, thir- I'm 32 next month, so I don't have a ton of life experience. But one of the hardest things that we went through uh, as a couple is, is, is um, our infertility. We spent five years praying and, and trying to decide, okay, Lord, do we adopt? Do we do in vitro? What do we do? Because we want to have kids. And, and we spent days and weeks and months being mad at God, being confused. Lord, what the heck is going on? And through that process, the Lord taught my wife and I how to understand him in, in the area of peace. Because for so long we said, okay, God, if you're not going to give us a child, we want at least to be at peace with it. So we would pray, Lord, give us peace. Lord, give us peace. And finally, one day, he revealed to my wife, and she later shared with me. She said, I was praying, God, give me peace. And he said, I'm not going to give you peace. I am peace. Remain in me. So God doesn't just give us little gifts of, of peace or joy here and there. No, no, no. It's found in the person of Christ. We find it in him. He says, I am peace. So I don't know what you're going through this morning. You may be here and you are, you are experiencing turmoil. Maybe you're just having a hard time in your marriage. It's just rocky. You're battling trying to raise your kids and getting on the same page with them. Maybe your, your finances are all out of whack or you're in between jobs. Maybe you're, just, you're confused about life contemplating whether or not you even want to stay on earth. Maybe you're, 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 you're dealing with the pain of a lost loved one or, or you're confused about your sexuality and you're just thinking, okay, I, I don't understand. I have to say this morning, wherever you are, Jesus knows, wherever you are, here's, uh, heed this, remain in him. Remain in him him. He's, he's pruning. He's working things out so that you can look more like his son and less like the world. He's allowing or using things that are going on in your life to steer you in a place where you trust him, where you come out of that situation and you say, man, I don't ever want to go back through that, but I'm so grateful that God brought me through because now I'm on the other side and now I have more fruit in that area. So I don't know where you're at, but I want you to understand, Jesus knows. He understands your heart. He understands your confusion. He understands your pain. And he's with you in the midst of that. So remain in him. Don't avoid, don't run away. Remain in him. The Lord prunes so that we can produce more fruit. And it's hard most of the time. But again, the journey that we are on is a lifelong journey. Actually, it's an eternal journey. Because once we pass from this life to the next, then we get to live with him. And everything that we go through will literally be but a vapor a blink of an eye. So don't lose hope. Don't, don't, don't shrink back, but press in. Press into what God is doing in your life in this moment. And he says this to his disciples, which is kind of crazy. He says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message that I've given you. Now I want to remind you, this is literally within 24 hours of these guys completely turning their back on Jesus. I don't know that guy. Literally denying 
Peter denied Jesus to his face with curse words. I don't know that bleepity bleep. But Jesus had already said, listen, you have been purified and are being pruned, a continual pruning, because of the message that you received. If you're disconnected with Jesus, here's the simplicity of the gospel and how to be connected. Belief. They simply believed and took Jesus at his word when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father except through me. I am the bread of life. I will sustain you. I am the door. Come through me. I am the good shepherd. I will lead you. I am the resurrection and the life. There's no other life found other than in me. They believed his message. And he said, right before he's about to die, he said, you're already pure because you believe me. Listen, if you are disconnected from Jesus, all you have to do this morning to be connected to the vine is believe. You don't gotta clean yourself up. You don't gotta, you know, do a however many Hail Marys or, I mean, There's no requirement other than belief, and that's why it's the gospel. Because we don't get to take any credit for him for it. He deserves all the glory. He stood in the gap. He did the things that we could not do. He became who we could not become so that we can live in him and be united with him. He is the true vine. Again, it's the it's the gospel. We are connected to him by our trust, by our belief, by our faith. That's it. Now, will we do great things? Absolutely. But it begins with that spot. He says this, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Jesus, he's, he's, it's kind of like he's talking like a three-year-old. Like I talked to my daughter no, honey, you cannot hit the dog. Don't hit Callie. Salem, sis, come on. Quit. He, he's talking in a manner where he's repeating himself because how many of us know we don't hear it the first time, right? We are much like three-year-olds when Jesus is trying to talk to us. He's repeating himself. Listen. Apart from me, you cannot do anything. Apart from me, you cannot produce fruit. That's why I'm here. Because you weren't able to produce fruit that pleased God. That's why I'm the vine. Because I will and I'll help you do it now. He says this. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. This is... This idea of vital communion with God. Jesus remaining in us, we remaining in him. We're connected. And it's hard to comprehend, it's even harder to explain. But somehow, when we say, okay, Jesus, I believe in you and I trust what you say is true, he comes into our lives. And from that moment on, we are connected to the living God literally connected to God by his spirit. This breaks my heart, and I see it time and time again. People will come into church, or they'll come into Anthem, our high school and junior high ministry, and they'll hang around for a couple weeks, and and they say yes to Jesus. And for whatever reason, they, they just, like, drop off the map, and you never see them again. And so I ask, hey, your friend Johnny, like, where's he at? Oh, you know, he, he went, you know, he went back to, he went back to his girlfriend, and now blah blah blah. And, or, you might come in here, and you, God reveals Himself to you, and you say yes to Jesus, and take off, and a couple weeks later, a, an addiction that you never saw come and creeps back in. And for whatever reason. Well, the reason is because when we feel like we offend, we avoid. When we feel or believe that we've offended somebody, we avoid that person. 
And I see it with people and God all the time, even though they're connected. They feel like they can't come before God because they feel like they've offended or messed up. And they have. But God's not, he's not in a place where he'll say, I gave you one chance and you screwed it up. So, sucks to be you. <laughs> That's not our God. But somehow we, we believe that in order to come to God now, we have to clean ourselves up. Right? Like we, we've got to look good on the outside and, and produce some fruit so that we can show it to God and say like, I'm st- we're still good, right? We just see it time and time again. But you have to understand, when you are connected to God, God sees you the same way that he sees Christ. And he sees Christ as his perfect and holy son that has all access to the kingdom, that has all access to everything the Father has, and so do you and me. See, when we're connected to the vine, we're in an amazing union with the heavenly Father, with the creator of the world. And Jesus is simply saying, remain in me. Remain in me. When we understand that Jesus is the true vine, we will teach ourselves to not run from God, but run towards him. In the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our pain, we just say, okay, that felt like you pruned me right there. Lord, I'm gonna run to you and figure out what the heck's going on. Run to him, not from him. And if you have friends, let me just say this. I didn't say this first first service but if you have friends that have come into church and they said yes to Jesus and then they did something where they feel like they can't come to God go rescue them just tell them you're believing a lie you're you're connected to God he wants you he loves you he he, you're welcomed and accepted just sometimes in order for us to get out of the mess we just need to reach up and somebody pull us out we have friends and family members that are in the same place Let's just, I got you. Let's do what Jesus would do for them, what Jesus has already done for them. Let's not let them believe the lie of the world that that we gotta clean ourselves up before we can come to God. Let's just go rescue them. Amen? He says this. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as, my, or just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. This is in your notes. As a disciple of Jesus, we have the power to love. See, I used to read this as, if I obey God's commands, then I'll be in his love. But actually, Jesus says, remain in my love and then obey in my obey my commands, and then you will remain in my love. So it doesn't start with obedience, it starts with love. And many of us, we have this backwards in our head. I have to prove to God that I love him by obeying his commands, when instead he says, no, I love you, therefore you can do what I've called you to do. It's the other way around. And we work so hard to try to prove to God that we love him when he says, no, no, no. All you have to work on is understanding my love for you. When we understand God's love for us, our disobedience is straightened out. And again, it's not overnight. It's a day-by-day, glory-by-glory process. Him teaching us, growing us in fruit, and then pruning us back, and then growing us, and then pruning us. It's this constant ebb and flow of walking with Jesus. So I just want to tell you this. Don't be so hard on yourself. I'm serious. Just remain in the love of God. It's in that place when it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance, not the other way around. Not us coming to God, oh God, I'm so sorry. Will you please be kind to me now? No. And that's why it's the gospel. That's why it's good news because we cannot earn his affection. All we can do is Receive it. 
As disciples of Jesus, we have the power to love God because he's given us that love. And out of that overflow of that, we begin to love others. We begin to serve and, and live out this life that he's called us to live out. I uh, got married uh, almost nine years ago. My wife and I, we lived, our first house was way out in West Valley, and we were renting, and we, we had got a house that had brand new carpets. At least that's my, uh, my excuse. And so I would come in the front door, and I would kick my shoes off right there by the front door. Um, and I like shoes, so I would normally not wear the same pair of shoes every day of the week. So by the end of the week, there could be four, five, six, maybe even seven pairs of shoes right by the front door. And uh, she reminded me this morning that she actually put a bucket, like a shoe box, by the front door to see if I would throw my shoes in there. I never did. And so she brought me over one day, and she just kind of point, pointed down at the shoes. She's like, what are those, you know? What are those? All the young per- people got them. And I was like, babe, they're shoes. <laughs> She's like, that's not where they belong. I even put a little bucket for you. See this bucket here? You could put them in there. Or you could put them in the closet where most normal people put their shoes. So over time, because of my love for my wife, I would take my shoes off and pick them up and either put them in the box or walk them to the closet. And she reminded me this morning that I have four pair of shoes right by my dresser. I'm like, well... At least I'm not trying to prove my love to you. Um, But that's how it is with Jesus. When we're in love with him, we do what he asks us to do. But we don't have to prove anything. And when we're going through some hard stuff, let's just ask ourselves the question, hey, God, are you pruning me? Is this something you're trying to work out in my life so that I can produce more fruit and look more like your son? And remain. Remain in his love. So why does this all matter? Again, if we believe that everything hinges on the fact that Jesus became what we could never become and do what we could never do, then we have to understand that he's saying this for a reason and there's some important things that he wants us to grab a hold of. And I believe it's this. He says this in verse 11. I have told you these things, the things that we just talked about, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. You have to understand this morning that happiness is not joy. So many people are living on the pursuit of happiness. right? They want to just be happy. If I just got a bigger car, I'd be happy. If I just had a nicer house or a a better wife or, or more money, I'd be happy. But all of that is just a dead end road. Because happiness is literally based on external experiences, external circumstances. Many of you, you probably woke up this morning, and you're like, dang, I'm in a good mood. Got my coffee, sun shining, I'm going to go fishing after church, or whatever. And you turn on the news, something crazy in our world's going on, and a little bit of that happiness diminishes. And you drive and go to get your second cup of coffee at Starbucks and you tell them your name's, you know, Randy and they write Andy or something. You're like, your happiness diminishes. You get on the freeway, you're driving to church and somebody in the left lane's going like 45. You're like, so by the time you get to church, literally it's the worst day of your life. That's how happiness works, because it's based on the external. But joy, joy is a deep-rooted confidence in what Jesus has accomplished. That Jesus became what we could never become, that he did what we could never do. Joy comes from that position. Understanding that I will never fulfill every single commandment of God, but yet I'm still accepted by him because of Jesus. That is joy. Knowing where you stand with God eternally, that is where 
joy comes from. That is the essence of joy. So Jesus is saying, I've told you all of this stuff that you need to be connected to me and then you can expect pruning and that you have a position in my presence and that you have the power to love. Why? So that you can be full of joy and live out the life that I've called you to live out. That's why Jesus says, I am the true vine. So this morning, I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you're going through. You could be on cloud nine. You could be in in your darkest hour. But I want to tell you this. Jesus is the true vine. Jesus is the very thing that you need to be connected to to have life and life to the full. He is the one that you need to be connected to to have life and life to the full. And if you're not connected, I want to pray for you. And if you feel like, man, I just, I don't know where I'm at with God, I want to pray for you. And you feel like, man, I'm in a season where I'm just life, I'm just being chopped at every corner. I want to pray with you. So with every eye closed, let me just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said that we could ask for anything. So Lord, I ask that you would produce that kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Father, that you would be producing that in our life even at the cost of pruning. Lord, we will expect to be pruned. So Lord, I pray for those that are in a very, uh, in a season in which you are pruning. Lord, that you would carry them, that you would strengthen them. Lord, that you would guide them, that you would uh, be the very comfort that they need. Lord, for those that are maybe just confused about where they are with you, God, I pray that you would reach out in that soft, still way that only you know how to do and to just grab them by the heart and to remind them that they are yours. Lord, we pray for those that aren't here that need to be rescued yet again. Lord, we ask that you'd give us courage and boldness to reach out. And again, with every eye closed, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you're not connected to Jesus, I believe that today's your day. So no one's looking around. All you need to do is just believe in Jesus. Just put your faith and your trust in him. And all you have to do to to make that happen is just to believe in your heart and to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you want to do that today, I want to pray with you. So would you just, if that is you, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me. I want you to pray for me. Just lead me in this prayer. I can follow Jesus. I see that hand. I see that hand. This hand right here in the back. That's so awesome. Heaven is literally doing backflips right now. So it's as simple as this. I'm gonna lead you into a a prayer. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and that you will be saved. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, for those that are, are sitting here with hands lifted saying, Jesus, I'm placing my faith in you. Lord, in their own ways, they're praying, I believe in you. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Father, I pray from this moment on that life would be different. Lord, that they would have a joy beyond all understanding. Lord, that they would uh, just be in a place where they can trust you and walk with you. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.